than one story when dealing with the futures. Um, so this is basically assuming that you've all got a basic um, familiarity with peak oil, with the theory, the fact that the amount of oil coming out of the ground um, has plateaued, plateaued in 2005, um, and is likely to decline um, over coming years, months, um, and decades, and will inexorably go down and trickle away to nothing, probably in a century or two. Um, so what I'd like to do is just run through, so this is a reminder to say, how much of this I'll get through, depending on how many questions you ask. So it'd be nice to talk about the five stages of peak oil, <coughs> which is modelled on five stages of grief. Second one is in terms of having multiple stories about the future, five Ps. Um, then talking about how people talk about the future, the four domains of the future, the quality of futures thinking. And then the last one is to have um, different stories, four scenario archetypes that are, can be used to sort of unpack what uh, might happen in the future. So um, first thing about the five stages of peak oil, it's developed by John Michael Greer based on the five stages of grief from the Kubler-Ross um, um, process. The first one being denial, um, which is where people commonly go to the point of saying, surely they will invent something, they will deploy something, um, solar or fusion or ethanol or someone will come up with something, I don't need to do anything, it's, it's all going to be saved. The second stage is anger, where there's anger at frustration that they haven't done something and that they haven't deployed what is known to happen, what is possible, what is, what is able to occur. Elite conspiracies have, solved the, have caused the problem. It's the petrol companies, it's the oil companies, it's the banks, it's the governments. They're all conspiring to prevent what we know can be done from being done. The third stage is bargaining to say, OK, I'm getting moving through the point of, of realising that, that it is actually happening, that it isn't conspiracies, it's what can we do? What, what, what can I do? What can society do? Massively roll out solar panels, massively roll out fusion, massively do something. We need to do something. Um, you get sort of the evangelicals phase at this point as well. Uh, the fourth phase is depression, um, where, you, where people go through uh, a loss of belief in the myth of progress, that technology will not solve everything that there are some predicaments that technology cannot solve. Um, and so you could go through people saying, well, this is where, well, humanity was never going to amount to much anyway. We're also brought down by the baser instincts of our, our prehistoric selves. This is all about us, you know, mankind is fundamentally evil. We're going to return back to our roots. Um, and then the fifth stage is acceptance. Depression. So it's denial, anger, bargaining, depression, and then finally acceptance where well, you come up with practical plans in your own life of how to deal with effective peak oil. So that's when you start seriously coming up with changing your career plans for a low energy future, um, changing your hobbies to prepare for a, a second or third sort of form of income um, that rely on um, things that don't require any, any energy inputs, organic gardening, um, using slide rules as steampunk calculators, as John Michael Greer puts it. Um, so the next phase to look at though is to always think about five, five ways of thinking about the future. And one of the things that I've, that I've seen at a couple of bar camp presentations is lots of discussions about the future, but not much in the way of actually thinking about a systemic framework for thinking about the future. So I'd like to pick up the work of, of Joe Voros um, from the Swinburne um, Masters of Strategic Foresight. He talks about the five P's. The first P is the potential, the sheer infinite potential of all possibilities the key point about this one is that there are some futures that are beyond your imagination. The second one is the second level down in the smaller set is talking about the possible. This is what we can imagine, what might happen, but it relies on future knowledge and technologies and principles that haven't been discovered yet. Um, the third one, narrowing it down further, is the plausible. What relies on current knowledge? What are the things that we can do from the things that we already know how to do? The fourth one, narrowing it down even further, is the probable. What are those futures that are likely to happen based on current trends? But all of that is talking about one set of, of principles. The fifth P is where the, the agency of human choice comes in to say, what is the preferable future? What do we want to have happen? What do we actually want to fight for? What is it that we want to achieve in our own lives and our own societies? The next concept that I'm moving on to Whirlwind is talking about four domains of the future. This is, comes from work by Richard Slaughter and Sahail Inutala. It talks about the quality of futures work that you see 
that you perceive that, that is uh, flying around. The first one is at the top level. It's the surface, it's the shallow, it's the sort of the litany, it's pop futures. It's what you see in the headlines of the Daily Telegraph saying chaos, destruction, the government is doing this, the government is doing that, people are doing this. Um, or it's you see it on, on shallow television stories or news sites or said all the wonders of science and technology. Um, in terms of peak oil and in terms of oil futures, the sorts of things that they talk about, uh, isn't it fantastic? We've got massive oil fields discovered off the coast of Brazil. That'll, that'll solve the problem forever. Or the Keystone Pipeline of the US will bring down all this shale oil from Canada to export in, in, um, from the US. Um, the, the ultimate symptom of the litany is the point where you say, why aren't they doing something? Surely someone can do something about this. The government or, or the mysterious they can do something. The second level, an increasing level of sophistication, is futures work that is oriented towards solving a particular problem. So it actually looks at the systemic causes of what causes the problem. So you're looking at a data-driven situation. Um, so there's a bit more analysis. Um, and that's where you talk about its solutions as being building networks between existing institutions, so between businesses, business and governments, between different government organisations. So there's a bit of greater understanding that what you need to do and the solutions that you're looking for are driven by data and driven by understanding deeper causes. And the third level down is to look at the worldviews and to look at having a, a critical, by critiquing what is going on in the world. So this is the the, the domain where you're aware of fundamentally different stakeholder views or paradigms or worldviews. In politics, it's left versus right versus Democrat versus Green uh, versus Tea Party, um, feminist versus um, Tea Party again. Um, this is where you get to, <laughs> or you get down to, you know, the deeply held views of religious and spiritual traditions to say that each of those f traditions and worldviews fundamentally structure how problems are structured and how problems are framed. And so this is where you get into the discussion of, of a plurality of different ways of framing problems. And in some cases, they may not be problems. They'll be seen as being opportunities or they'll be seen as, well, this is just the way the world is. Um, and in these cases, you're, t you're talking to writers and philosophers, people who are, who are outside the existing power structure, um, who are thinking about things that uh, the government isn't necessarily thinking about. And then the next deepest level down is the layer of myths and metaphors, and memes if you like, um, where the people who use these are artists and visionaries, um, movies, etc. Um, that's where you get myths and metaphors like the zero-sum game, or a rising tide lifts all boats, um, or in terms of peak oil, drill baby drill, just, just unleash the market. That's where you also talk about metaphors, about you coming to a fork in the road and saying you can choose to go one way or the other, or you're rolling the dice. You have no choice, the, your fate is in the dice. Or if you're in many um, powerless situations, the metaphor you have is that you're actually a passenger in a car being driven by someone else, and that other, the driver is blindfolded. So you have no control over what's going on, and the driver has no idea where they're going. And then finally, so that's, so you need to be aware of, and what helps to structure your thinking is to be aware of the different, the P's of the future. So what's, what the potential is, what's possible, what's plausible, what's probable, and then what is preferable. Looking through the, the four domains. And then finally, um, and I seem to be running through material too fast, um, which allows more time for questions, hopefully. So coming down to the, the, the crux of the matter is to say we need more than one story. Um, so the stories that, you, that tend to fly around the, the blogosphere and, and the web space um, in terms of peak oil are either technology will solve it all, progress will continue, um, the stars are within our, within our grasp, or where an apocalyptic collapse next year, next week, the financial markets will collapse, um, or we'll be in, in destitute and ruin and living in caves. There are, more, there are more stories than that. And to help you function um, as consenting adults in that future, you need more than one story. You need more than one myth, more than one lens to look through and examine those futures. 
So Jim Data uh, from the, the University of Hawaii Political Science um, has used what he knows, calls scenario archetypes for types of scenarios that, that help you to, to place yourself in the future. The first one is, is the one that we're all perhaps all more familiar with, is in terms of continued growth. Growth will continue, progress will continue, technology will solve everything. That's what we know, that's what we, we live, and that's what we breathe as a day to day. The second scenario archetype is that of collapse, is that of talking about um, that things will fall to ruin, that things will not be as they are today, that things will get worse. But even within, within that, you can nuance it as to say, within the peak oil discourse, is it, what's the timing of that? Is it a fast crash or a slow crash? Is it something that will unfold over the matter of days or weeks, such as a GFC Mark II? So you need to be prepared and, and packed up with your survival food and guns and, and seeds and whatever, ready for the market to crash next week? Or is it more of a slower, just long-term descent, such as the collapse of the Roman Empire or the collapse of the Mayan Kingdom, which, took, which unfolded over centuries? There were periods of decade-long periods of uncertainty, crisis, chaos, depressions, and then there would be a period of stability. And then there'd be another decade-long period of, of crisis and chaos. But it was a stepwise descent over a long period of centuries, which requires a different set of mindset from saying, it's all going to hell in a handbasket next week, keep partying. The third scenario archetype after continued growth and collapse is to look at a, a steady state society, one where society chooses or has chosen for it, that we will keep things the same. Um, a theocracy um, is, is one common example, or um, Japan after, say, the 16th century when they decided to close their borders uh, from European trade. They decided they would keep to their traditional customs and way of doing things. They'd allow in limited, a tiny small amount of controlled imports, but their society and culture was basically in stasis for three centuries until the US uh, and Thomas Perry forcibly reopened their contact with the outside world in 1854. So that's a, that is a choice that societies have made in the past and it is one that is available as a story that we can choose in the future. And then there's the, the fourth one is talking about transformation. And again, that's one that would be familiar to regular participants of Bar Camp and, and TEDx and the like. Um, and that's talking about change. Things that fundamentally change the rules of the game. So whether it be in forms of technology, or whether it be forms of spirituality um, or other forms that, that basically change the fundamental rules by which societies operate um, and, and the, the options that then fall out. So that's the end of my content because I was expecting a little bit more to and fro, but that's fine. You've been a great audience. Um, so to recap, five stages of peak oil, denial, anger, bargaining, depression and acceptance, five Ps. Be aware of the full potential that there are futures out there that you cannot imagine. That there are, but, uh, but also be aware of what's possible, what's plausible, what's probable, but ultimately what is preferable. Be aware of this, be aware of that there is a difference in sophistication and the quality of futures thinking out there. That there's a, there's a vast difference between the litany level that is shouting headlines at you, saying chaos, crisis, disruption, war, they need to do something, why hasn't the government done something yet, you don't need to do anything, through to problem solving that actually sits down and relies on the data and actually relies on the facts and, and looks at what the science says and, and recognises that, that that is a valued, valued source of information. Or the, that of multiple worldviews that says different, different cultures, different religions, different political perspectives, all are equally valid, all have relevant viewpoints and all are sources of hope and optimism all the way down to the myths and metaphors that we tell each other, that which, are, which in many ways turn up as advertising slogans. Um, yeah, that sort of thing. Um, so, thank you for your time. <laughs>